Okay. Cool. I think I'm going to begin then. Uh, thank you to everyone who is attending. Um, and I am again Seth Musser. Um, Hopefully by the end of today, you'll be tired of me talking and you'll be looking forward to um, Robert talking next week on deconfined quantum criticality. Uh, but this week I am going to be talking about uh, more quantum spin liquids, specifically the Kataev model um, and one of the candidate materials, alpha ruthenium trichloride. Okay, so this week I am going to be drawing on um, Kataev's original paper for a lot of my presentation um, in order to have you believe some of the approximate things I'll do later on. We'll walk step by step through that. Uh, but also I'm drawing on uh, an excellent review by Leon Valence um, and some other talks given by people. Um, when I post this talk onto YouTube, I'm gonna include links to these in the description. Um, so that way everyone should be able to access this and, and see for themselves. Okay, so last time um, I went over some uh, candidates for quantum spin liquids. We were talking about that resonating valence bond state of, with all these fluctuating um, valence bonds. And, and we mentioned that one of the hallmarks or the hallmark of quantum spin liquids is this long range entanglement. Um, and we showed that that leads to non-local fractional excitations um, in the models we considered and that those excitations are sometimes interesting and anionic. Um, we also mentioned that they are difficult to find experimentally uh, because a lot of the experimental probes we have are for local order parameters. Um, and again, quantum spin liquids really have this long range entanglement. Okay, so that's just a review of last time. What do I wanna cover this time? Um, so in order to solve some of the uh, approximations and hand wavings that I was doing last time, we're going to introduce a really um, incredible model, the exactly solvable Kataev model. Um, then we're going to solve it with Majoranas, and we're going to see that it's a quantum spin liquid by our standards of last time. Um, we'll look at some experimental signatures um, and actual experiments to try to find that, and then we'll look at, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get to the projective symmetry group, um, but if we don't uh, that, that's fine. I will include a link to Michael Levin's uh, really good talk on uh, partons and the projective symmetry group. Okay, so we'll start off with the Kataev model. Um, all of these sort of hand wavy things that we were doing with the resonating valence bond state, uh, you can rejoice because we don't have to do that kind of thing here. Um, Instead, we'll write, Kataev wrote down what seemed at the time like kind of an ad hoc Hamiltonian. Um, so instead of the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, where on each link of a lattice, so in this case we're considering the hexagonal lattice, um, where on each link you have the full spin dot product, here we are going to be taking only part of um, this spin dot product. So the type of bond we have will determine the type of interaction. Um, and just as a note, uh, Kataev originally used J's here. So you'll see in some figures uh, there's, there are J's, uh, but uh, in recent papers, this has been re renamed as K's uh, in honor of Kataev. Okay, so let's try to understand why this model might be important. Um, and if we define this hopping term, so on an X link, um, this is going to be sigma xi, sigma xj, uh, so on and so forth. So the, the Hamiltonian is just the sum over these terms scaled appropriately with those constants k. Uh, so let's define that and let's also define the product of these hopping terms around some sort of hexagonal plaque. Um, so if you work this out, you'll see that actually the product around this hexagonal plaque is exactly the product of the um, bonds that stick out of the flat cap. So sigma 1x, sigma 2y, so on and so forth. Okay, well the interesting thing is um, all of these hopping operators are going to commute with all of these flat cap operators. Um, and you can see this 
just directly, you write out the plaquette, uh, you look at one hopping operator, you're going to get a minus sign when you commute the sigma one through and another minus sign for the sigma two. And so you see we have um, this commuting operation. So that means that we're going to have this infinite family of conserved quantities here, WP. Uh, and W is Hermitian and it squares to one. So we have these kind of plus or minus ones on every plaquette that it is going to be conserved. Okay, so that's a hint that the model might be interesting, but we wanna dive in to really making sure that we can exactly solve this. And we do that through a Majorana decomposition. Um, and as I said, I'm gonna be very precise here so that later on when I talk about the parton um, treatment of mean field, you will believe me uh, because I'll link it back to this. Okay, so what Kataev does is he takes his hexagons, he takes a site and he defines um, four Majoranas on each site. Um, and you recall that a Majorana fermions are real, they're their own antiparticle um, and they anti-commute. Uh, the one thing to note here is that suddenly each site on the lattice has Four, uh, four dimensions. This is a four-dimensional Fox space now, whereas the spin space was two-dimensional. So as some of the discussion um, before this talk was alluding to, we need a way uh, to get rid of those degrees of freedom and get back to some physical degrees of freedom. Um, and that comes in the form of this D operator that Kataev defines. So on each site, we just take the product of these four Majoranas. We note that again, this is Hermitian, and again, it squares to one. So it is going to split this 4D Fox space, um, which we'll call M prime, into eigenspaces with plus or minus one. And in order to be physical, we're going to restrict to an eigenspace uh, where uh, D is equal to one here. Okay. So we've sort of defined this, we've defined the restriction, but how does this relate to the original model? Um, and we map it with this definition. So we define some sort of sigma prime, which is- Sorry, to just stop space. it here, please? Yeah, sure. For, for a second. Why do we need to restrict ourselves to space for a D plus one? What, what is the condition of physicality? Yeah, so um, I think the best way to, to understand this is that we just need to get from the four degrees of freedom down to two degrees of freedom. Uh, so we could equally have well have chosen D equals minus one uh, to restrict ourselves to. And we would have just had to change um, some conventions here. Mm -hmm, I see. Thank you. Um, but the, so the interesting thing, if we have sigma prime um, is equal to this product of, of these Majoranas, then you see that we have a Hermitian operator. It uh, commutes with D and it has this product, uh, which you could work out, for example, for X and Y, uh, which looks exactly like uh, the commutation relations of poly matrices with the exception of this D here. Uh, so as long as we restrict to M where D is equal to one, this will be a faithful representation of the Pauli matrices. Um, so in other words, we, we have this expanded Majorana space, um, but it should faithfully represent our operators, our spins when we restrict uh, to our physical space. Okay, so that's a lot of formalism, a lot of words, uh, but what is the picture here? Um, well, we can think of each hopping operator with spins, we can take that back to our uh, 4D Fox space. And we can think of it as a product of four Majoranas. So it's cortic in the Majoranas. Um, and on, for each spin, we'll have some C, which sits here, and we'll have some link U, which links up the bonds. Um, now this link is Hermitian. It also squares to zero, or squares to one, sorry. So it will have eigenvalues plus or minus one. Um, but why 
are these links important? Um, okay, so the Hamiltonian, if we take it back to the, this uh, tensor product of all the 4D Fox spaces on each site, um, the Hamiltonian will look like this. And the crucial thing that makes uh, the Kataev model solvable, the kind of miracle here, is that all of these link operators commute with each other, and they also commute with the Hamiltonian. Um, so often, when we'll have a quartic Hamiltonian like this, we need to resort to mean field theory. We have to pretend that things are their averages, and we have to ignore fluctuations. Um, but here, everything is precise. Uh, and so we can restrict to eigenspaces of these views. Okay. So uh, just as a quick side note, this is kind of like long range entanglement. If we're restricting to subspaces where these views have a certain value, we can think of that kind of as fluctuating bonds. Um, so if it's one, they're paired. If it's negative one, they're not paired. Um, I'm not going to stretch this analogy too far, uh, but there's a good uh, Nature Review article that sort of discusses that. Okay. Now. Sorry. Uh, can I just, ask, I think I, maybe, uh, yeah, we'll look at these. So uh, the, the use, so we're, we're already working in this uh, subspace where the D things you defined are all fixed. It could be numbers, right? Yeah. So well, so, so what we've done is we've taken the Hamiltonian back to the tensor product of 4D Fox spaces. Okay. And when we, when we find um, the, when we find some sort of wave function for that, mm -hmm. we're going to want to project it to the space where all these Ds are one. Um, okay, so so then the fact about the commutativity with these u i j variables is that does that mean that you actually you have like extra conserved quantities in this Hamiltonian or in addition? Yeah. To the, so so that's a good point because I mentioned all these fluxes, right? Those are conserved. Did the, does the u thing mean extra conservation? Oh uh, yeah. Um, so. Yeah, br so briefly, I just want to point out that we can project back to the space of, of um, fluxes on plaquettes, uh, but the flux on a plaquette is connected to these U operators. Um, so if you, again, take the flux back to this uh, tensor product of 40 uh, flux spaces, you'll find that it's actually given by the product of um, all of these linkages around the plaquette. Um, and so the conservation of each of these linkages uh, gives us the conservation of the flux. But Ethan is, uh, is right that we actually have uh, more freedom now than we originally did. Um, and that is reflected in the fact that this U hat is a Z2 gauge field. Um, so the Z2 part comes because it squares to zero, so it's going to have plus or minus uh, one eigenvalues, and it lives on the links between sites. Uh, but more importantly, so suppose I have a plus one flux here, um, and all of the U's are plus one. That works out, right? It all multiplies, that's fine. But if I now change this U to minus one and this U to minus one, I'm not going to have a different flux. So I have some gauge freedom um, in defining my views that I can take advantage of. Um, so, so the, the number of, uh, if you take like total number of degrees of freedom minus total number of uh, conserved quantities, it's number of vertices minus number of plaquettes, is that correct? Um, yeah, that should be right, yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't compute this exactly, but it should hold out to give you the, the difference between uh, your extended space and your, your physical space. Hmm. Um, okay, so if we have this Hamiltonian on M prime, the Majorana space, uh, 
we can show, uh, and Katayev did this numerically, but there's actually a proof by Lieb. Uh, Katayev calls it a very beautiful proof by Lieb that shows that the ground state of this Hamiltonian is the one with plus ones on every single um, flat cap. And we can use our gauge freedom to just choose u equals to plus one on every single link, and we'll have a quadratic Hamiltonian in C. Um, so those of you who haven't taken solids, you'll see this type of thing very shortly, but this is just the standard hopping um, on a hexagonal lattice. And when these are all ones, um, it will be uh, not difficult at all to diagonalize this. And we get this sort of phase diagram for different values. Again, Kataev uses J, uh, I've been calling that K. But um, for some values of the couplings, um, we get a gapless phase, which is shown here, where we have these two bands and they touch. So in the ground state, they touch at zero, the ground state will be all things filled below zero, and we'll be able to excite Majoranas above that. Um, in the gapless phase, there will be some gap to exciting Majoranas. Um, okay, we'll later see that the gapless phase is very relevant for experiment, but we're going to start in the gap phase. Uh, before we do though, I just want to summarize, since it, what we did was pretty formally, but uh, what we did here to solve the Kataev model is we formally fractionalized the spins, we extended our Hilbert space and restricted to physical space, um, we found that gauge fields appeared, uh, and all of this will be important when we consider parton constructions. Okay, so excitations. What do the excitations look like? I promised you we'd have an interesting uh, spin liquid, so hopefully we'll, we'll see fractional excitations and maybe even any odds. Um, so first we're going to start in the kz much greater than kx, ky uh, phase. And we'll get some band structure, which looks like this. We'll fill up the lower band, and we gap out Majoranas. Uh, so what is interesting? Um, well, sorry, can I, can I ask another yeah, question? Yeah, sure. Uh, is there any, what, like, why, do, do, do you know why we knew how, why, do you know why we knew to use Majoranas here? Like, what's, what's the structure of the Hamiltonian that tells us we should be using these? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good question. Um, and so I, I would like, guess I'm, I'm oh. answering, I guess I'm self, being self-referential, but at the end of my presentation, I'll, I'll get into parton construction. Um, and you could have, for example, tried a parton construction here with fermions, uh, like normal complex fermions, not Majoranas. Um, and my guess is what you would have seen is that um, you need you need possibly the Majoranas emerge from that because uh, certainly the Majoranas are are uh, combinations of complex fermions. Each complex fermion can be thought of as two Majoranas. Um, I don't think that's satisfying though. Um, I think Kataev was just very smart. Um, he, I, I mean, I haven't been able to find any account where he's like, oh yeah, I was staring at this for a while and this is why I tried this. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe someone else knows better than I. Um, maybe there's some intuitive reason, but I, I was not able to find anything. Um, maybe, maybe I, I guess it's just like nor normally when you're doing partons and stuff, you use complex fermion because, you know, the complex fermions can be counted, like right? They have, they have you have u one particle number for the con yeah, you know, exactly. And so you can you can have like when you consider mean fields for them, it, it makes more sense. But I maybe, think since you're saying we're not doing any kind of mean fields, maybe that's they're not important. Yeah, I I mean that that's the key is that um, this model is solvable exactly, and so we don't have to resort to mean fields. Um, but later on, what we'll see is that when we can no longer exactly solve it in some limit, it will be really helpful to turn to the, the complex fermion right. okay. uh, part-time construction. 
Um, okay, so yeah. having said, uh, sorry, what did you say? Oh yeah, I, I guess I, I, maybe that kind of answered my question. I, I wanted to know like, is the description here in terms of Myron as like telling something us telling us something about like the generic physics of the model like when perturbations are added and stuff like this or is it just I don't a, think so um, kind of an unphysical tool that we use to solve in this one specific limit yeah I, I think so later on people do parton constructions like um, uh, Ashwin did a, a pretty interesting parton construction of this model with the magnetic field um, and they mapped it back to Majorana's, but I think that was for historical reasons, not necessarily um, for any insight that they gained. Okay, thank you. Uh, and certainly if you're thinking about a phase transition and on one side of the phase transition is the Kataev spin liquid, you wanna be able to translate from Majorana into complex fermion. Um, but yeah, other, other than that. I don't think it tells you that much. Okay, so non-local excitations. Well, I've been hinting at these fluxes um, and they will, they're going to live in each lattice. Uh, and so you can always already sort of guess that they're, they're non-local. Um, and there will be some gap to creating them. Uh, it's on the order of K, but how do we actually do that with our operations? Um, Yes, okay, so uh, you can recall that the flux is a product of all these link variables, and you could check for yourself that if I act with a sigma z at site two, uh, what this is going to do is flip the flux on this link. So if my ground state has plus one, um, plus one u's on every single link, and I flip this guy, then suddenly I have two negative one fluxes. Um, and this is our fractional excitations that we hope to see in a spin liquid. Um, but here we can try to um, go for broke and see if we can see uh, anionic behavior as well. Um, and to do that, we think about applying sigma y prime uh, right here. And what we'd like to do, that will flip u here. And so we'll have a negative one uh, a negative one there and a negative one there. So this guy will still be negative one. This guy will be plus one. This guy will be negative one. Um, that's step one of the loop. We can apply operators along every single one of these links that flip it. And maybe you can already see what type of loop operation I'm building. Um, but I get done and I have this loop operator that effectively takes my flux all the way around. Um, but this loop operator is just exactly the, the operator which tells me the flux on this site. Uh, so when I act on my wave function uh, with that, I'm going to get a negative sign because I have a negative flux here. Um, so these two fluxes are mutual semions I take the one around the other and I get a negative sign. Um, that's the kind of anionic behavior I alluded to um, in the resonating valence bond state. Okay, um, to be more precise, uh, you, you have to really uh, use degenerate perturbation theory and think about the limit. Ah, these should have been Ks, I left them as Gs. When uh, Kz is much, much greater than Kx and Ky, uh, in that limit, we have strong pairing along the z direction where it likes to be two spins up, two spins down, um, and your lattice sort of breaks into these chains where you have two types of lysons, the E and the M lyson. Um, but I'm not going to get into that. Basically, there, there is some anionic behavior, so you can hopefully be satisfied with the criteria from last time that this is a spin liquid and we can describe it precisely. Okay, but what about detection? Um, so, so far spin liquids are hard to detect because they have all this non-local information, but can we find some sort of local um, killer signature that would let us know we have a Kataya spin liquid? Um, and to do that, we're gonna consider the gapless phase. Uh, so Kx equals Ky equals Kz, 
um, and we fill up this lower band and we have uh, no gap to exciting Majoranus. Okay, now we have our sample. Here's our sample in the bulk. Our Majoranas just travel around gaplessly, and suddenly we're going to turn on a magnetic field. Uh, to do this, we'll need degenerate perturbation theory, which um, I'm not going to work out. But the basic idea is that um, if we consider in degenerate perturbation theory, we have to go from our ground state, which is the flux free sector, and we have to apply some sequence of terms that take us back to that. So we can't just apply a sigma on a single link uh, because that introduces fluxes. Instead, we have to go um, around some kind of a loop. And what you'll see is that we get uh, basically our same model as before, but now we have hopping instead of from nearest neighbor, we have next nearest neighbor hopping. Um, and that has kappa, which is like hx, hy, hz over j squared. Okay, so in terms of band structure, this is going to take our um, gapless dispersion at our Dirac points, and it's going to gap it out with a gap of the order kappa. Um, and if we transform this Hamiltonian to K space, uh, I won't go into this, but you can easily see this in any um, solid state course that this is the Hamiltonian you're going to get with these two uh, vectors here. The reason I bring that up is because this Hamiltonian um, looks like the dot product of some vector with poly matrices. Um, so you know that it's Hermitian and you know that it's traceless uh, and two by two. So we should be able to write this where D is some sort of vector which is taking the Brill one zone uh, with periodic boundary conditions, which is a torus, to R3. Um, so why, why have I banged on so much about the exact form of this? Um, it's because when I do this gapping out, I give each band a churn number. Um, so some of you might, may not have seen this, uh, but the churn number basically is counting the windings of this vector uh, that I wrote down. So if we look at the unit vector here, we're going to have some mapping from the Brillouin zone, uh, which is a torus when we have periodic boundary conditions, to a sphere. And we want to count the winding of that um, about the, the origin. And it turns out that when we do, after we've gapped out these bands, one band will have a negative one churn number, the other will have a plus one. Okay, so the reason I focus on turn number and the reason it's interesting is because it's quantized. It's a topological feature. Uh, and that means it can't be changed adi adiabatically. Uh, there's no like little perturbation we can do because it, it must be an integer. Um, and in order to change the churn number, we're going to require band closing. So we'd have to go make our bands touch in some way and then have them separate in order to change the, the churn number. Um, but what does that mean if we have a sample with a boundary? So because we fill up the lower band, we know that this sample is going, all the Majoranas are going to have uh, churn number minus one. And out here in the vacuum, um, where we have very boring trivial uh, matter, and so the churn number should be zero. Um, but in order for this to happen, we must have some sort of band closing. And that indicates that the bands close at the edge. So we have some sort of gapless dispersion in the end, edge. Um, so in the bulk, again, the magnetic field gaps out the Majoranas. They're not moving around here, but they certainly are moving around at the edge. Uh, and we might ask what direction they move. Um, so if you can show that they travel in a single direction, they're chiral, um, and this direction ends up fixed by the churn number. Uh, so in particular, if you would change the sign of a single component of the magnetic field, you should flip this and flip the direction that the edge modes are traveling. Okay, but all of this was in search of 
an experimental signature. So what exactly is the experimental signature that this will tell us about? Um, and that is the thermal Hall effect. Um, so now imagine I take my sample and I make it very, very lo uh, long in the y direction. And I apply some sort of differential heat gradient. So over here it's hotter, over here it's colder. The average temperature is the average of these and there's some difference. Um, well, you can already see that uh, what should happen is I should excite more Majoranas over here on this edge. So the flow over here on the right edge is going to be greater than the left edge. And I'm gonna get some kind of net heat transport. Um, so a gradient in X is going to induce heat transport in Y, and this is the thermal Hall um, coefficient. So it's, it's generically, it's a feature of the conformal field theory uh, that describes this state that it can be written in this form where C is the central charge. Um, and the punchline here, yeah, what's up? Well, maybe I should let you say this slide first, but since, since, since the fact that you have, you have uh, C over, yeah, C is one half here, that, this seems to mean that the description in terms of the Majorana is, is physical, like it's not just an uh, artificial thing you use to sort, solve the Hamiltonian, right? Like adding oh, yeah, you're saying like they're, re they're real excitations in the system, the Majoranas. Right. So, so yeah, that, that, seems, yeah. that seems to mean that this like description in terms of Majoranas is kind of like fun fundamental. Yeah, I suppose. So I, I think I was interpreting your question um, at, at first as like uh, more along the lines of how would we see that emerge? Mm -hmm. um, and, but, but yes, I, I think you're right. So the C equals one half means that there really are these fractionalized, they look like half of a fermion uh, because they're real carrying heat uh, in the system. Uh, and we should observe that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think probably what would happen is if you tried to describe the system in a parton way, you would find some sort of constraint which uh, ensured that C equals a half. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, okay, so this should be our, our signature, right? This is not going to happen for normal fermions. Um, they have central charge one um, because they don't look like these interesting fractionalized Majoranas. Um, Cool, so that's our signature, but can we even find this? Uh, I started out talking about this incredibly contrived model where the spins have some sort of very weird um, correlation uh, with each other based on the bond direction. Um, and in 2009, Jacelli and, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Khalilin, um, they showed that yes, this can actually happen. So I think last time I, I talked about the Hubbard model where we have our electrons hopping around. Um, and if we have one electron per site, they tend to, we tend to get a Heisenberg-like interaction. Uh, that's usually what you would expect in materials. But if you put your, um, if you put your ions in a background um, field of oxygen in some sort of octahedral um, environment, then their orbitals, uh, the, the d orbital of the electron, uh, can have two different forms, um, or rather a, a number of different forms, but two are shown here, and they end up canceling each other so that um, you don't see Heisenberg uh, interaction. And in fact, the dominant interaction in these materials should be Kataev-like. Uh, so just briefly, you can hit some samples with x-rays, and you can see that uh, using the spin structure factor, uh, we get some very anisotropic uh, correlations um, in the Brillouin zone. Um, so there, there's some truly some Kataev exchange. It, it ends up that this is not contrived, um, which was really interesting. 
uh, when people found this. Um, but it's unfortunate because the model we were working with, the pure Kataev model, um, all the way down to zero temperature, it has this spin liquid uh, state with these Majorana zipping around and these Z2 fluxes coming through. Um, but when you actually look at the real material, so if you look at alpha ruthenium trichloride, uh, which is a candidate material, you see that it orders at seven Kelvin. Um, and here I have a, a picture of that ordering. Uh, what you'll find is that it's this weird zigzag order where the spins are classical and um, aligned in these rows. Um, and there has been some numerical work to suggest, as well as some X-ray scattering, that this is due to subdominant terms, where we have a small uh, Heisenberg, a small residual Heisenberg interaction, as well as some gamma term. Um, okay, so I, at this point, it may seem like hope is dead uh, because we have this really interesting spin liquid state. Uh, we really hope to observe it in a material somewhat miraculously, the, the components were there. Uh, but we're not actually able to observe it because of this ordering. Um, and that's when uh, some people got an idea to try to halt the ordering with a magnetic field. So you can already see, like if I have this zigzag anti-ferromagnetic order and I add in a magnetic field, if I make the magnetic field large enough, these spins are going to want to flip. Um, and they're going to want to behave classically and we're going to get into a polarized state. Um, and this is from an experimental group. They wondered whether or not they could see an intermediate spin liquid state. Um, so we don't necessarily have to have a trivial uh, sort of phase diagram where we go from zigzag ordered all the way to polarized right at once. We might have an, uh, sorry, we might have an intermediate um, spin liquid state. And in fact, uh, potentially this was actually seen uh, by Matsuda's group in uh, Kyoto. They had the sort of sample geometry that I showed and they measured the um, thermal hall conductivity. And what they found is that it's basically for a range of magnetic field va uh, values, it's bang on uh, half when you remove all these kinds of things. So this should be the signature of the uh, quantum spin liquid. As oh, oh, sorry, I have yeah. a question. So can you go back one slide? Yeah. Oh no, no, no the next one. This one? Oh, go go ahead. Yeah, where you show the experimental plots. Yeah. So I'm wondering why the arrow bar is larger for lower temperatures. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. So I think um, I have not looked too deeply into this. And the reason is that uh, Fu and Ong at, Prin at Princeton has not been able to uh, reproduce this. So the these are some really interesting experiments, uh, but they could potentially be fatally flawed um, in, in some way. Um, so, yeah. If I remember correctly a discussion on this from that Princeton school, like. Uh, in the summer, yeah, it's because you're calculating the you don't calculate it directly the kappa oh, yeah, by so you matrix, but you surface. have to calculate the inverse, and then in that process you get uh, errors in processing the data. Yeah, and there's additionally Fu and Ong was talking about um, some hysteresis uh, of their sample that they had to correct for. Um, so okay. all the, all, all of these errors compound. Um, and as, as Felipe mentioned, um, when you're doing your inversion, you're going to introduce uh, some factor of kappa XX. And in our pure spin liquid, the Majoranas were supposed to be gapped out in the bulk. And so we weren't supposed to be able to conduct heat across the bulk, um, not without exciting some bisons or, or across the gap or something. Um, but actually in this sample, there's way more bulk conductance than there is edge conductance. Um, so Leon Balance tried to address this 
uh, thinking about maybe phonons moving uh, across the sample conducting heat and determining whether that or not that would kill the spin liquid. Um, but at any rate, this half integer quantized uh, thermal hall has not been seen by Fu and Ong. Um, and so it's a really tantalizing uh, possible signature, but again, there's there are issues seeing it. Um, but uh, with every cloud, I guess, comes a silver lining. So uh, Fu and Ong did see magneto oscillations um, of, of this thermal Hall coefficient. Uh, you can, uh, as Felipe mentioned, this Princeton Summer School for Condensed Matter Physics, their, talk, uh, their talks are on YouTube, and you can check that out. Um, but the, it's really interesting to be able to see magneto oscillations um, of any quantity, because what that indicates is you have some sort of Fermi surface, which is coupling to the external magnetic field. Um, and that's especially interesting here because our spin liquid is neutral. Like these, the, the reason we had to look for, uh, dig at the bottom of the barrel and look at thermal hall uh, conductivity as opposed to normal hall conductivity is that the Majoranas are not charged. Um, and so we have some sort of neutral system which is nonetheless coupling to an external gauge field um, and leading to oscillation, so maybe there's a Fermi surface. All of this, very intriguing. Um, and it's connected to the fact that we were way out over our skis here in trying to say that this is a Kataev spin liquid. Um, because when we were thinking about Kataev spin liquids, we were only thinking about the perturbatively small um, magnetic field. But then we introduced all these other terms uh, in order to get zigzag order, and then we introduced a huge field. So it's not clear where we are. How do we deal with large magnetic fields? So, so, so if this Fermi surface thing is, right, I should, we need to be thinking in terms of complex fermions again. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's what, um, yeah, so, so there's some crossover potentially, um, I won't talk about it, but uh, what I found over the summer is that the crossover from a potential Kataev spin liquid that behaves the right way when it couples the external gauge field to the Fermi surface, the gapless spin liquid, um, this should be first order. It's not going to be um, a continuous phase transition. Um, but, but you could try to connect them, I guess, from Majoranas on one side to complex fermions on the other. Um, okay, so, so just very briefly, since we're way out over our skis, we turn to uh, numerical methods to see what happens at high uh, magnetic fields. And Hickey and Treps use exact di diagonalization, and what they see is, in fact, uh, for more than just perturbatively small magnetic fields, you get this Kataev spin liquid with these Majoranas and these fluxes. Uh, but if you go to larger fields, you find a gapless spin liquid. Um, so they have some sort of phase diagram here. When we turn on the magnetic field, we introduce a gap to the Majoranas. Um, but the gap to the bisons falls, and eventually we get into some thing here where maybe the bisons bind to the Majoranas, um, and there's a Fermi surface, so they zip around gaplessly. Um, and if we want to get to a mean field theory of this state, um, so we go from this U1 gapless Fermi surface that, that has been seen in the numerics to some kind of description of the Fermi surface, um, we're going to have to get to a mean field theory. And to do that, we need to fractionalize our spins, and a lot is going to deter, uh, depend on how. Um, so, I, I guess I'll go through the first maybe four or five slides here um, and then zip through uh, the rest. But if we recall from our Majorana decomposition, um, we formally fractionalized our spins, we extended our Hilbert space and restricted it, and then we had gauge conservation. So we want to take lessons from that and apply that to a sort of Fermi surface. Um, so in order to fractionalize, 
we're going to do this thing that we, we keep referencing um, where we write the spin operator in terms of complex fermions. Um, and you can check that this is formally okay, uh, that the, these fermions, uh, which have some spin, um, when, when we look at their anti-commutation relations, it's all gonna work out so that the spins have the right commutation relations. Um, but we note that obviously this is also gonna enlarge the Hilbert space because we've gone from two degrees of freedom to four. Um, each of these fermions has two spins. Um, yeah, and, and, and they are, yeah, complex. So um, we'll also introduce a gauge redundancy. So we could redefine each of these fi by some e to the i theta i, but it wouldn't change the definition of the spin at all. Um, and since spins are physical, we should be able to do this freely uh, without changing our physical theory. Um, and in fact, you can go further. You can write your spin in terms of this matrix of uh, our complex fermions. And then instead of just a U1 gauge redundancy, you have a SU2 gauge redundancy. So here we can mix the U1 charge of, of protons. Um, so again, you can check that this formally works out, uh, but as long as we have some WI here uh, in SU2, uh, we won't change the physical spin. Okay, so now let's think about the mean field theory in terms of the partons. So we have this state here, we're considering the, the phase where all the Ks are equal, and we'll take all the Hs in, we'll take H in the one, one, one direction. And we note that it's going to be quartic here. So it's quadratic in spins, which means it's quartic in, in these complex fermions. Um, but unlike the pure Kataev model, the introduction of this magnetic field uh, destroys all this nice commutation and we can't rely on the links to solve everything. Um, so in order to create mean field, uh, the mean field theory, we have to consider the mean field decoupling, which means replacing things by their expectation values. Uh, so you can introduce, with that big matrix of spins that I defined, you can introduce some sort of uh, matrix here, which describes the mean field theory parameters. Um, you have some hopping terms, um, and you have some pairing terms. Um, so when you, when you write this out, you'll just have your standard hopping terms, nearest neighbor, and your, your standard pairing terms. Um, the interesting thing is that these parameters will transform non-trivially under that gauge transformation. Um, but as I said before, this doesn't change our physical spin. So somehow we have to make sure that when this transforms under gauge transformation, our physical states don't change. Um, and we can take inspiration from the projection in, um, in the Majorana case. There we identified some sort of D and we restricted to an eigenspace to have the right degrees of freedom. Um, and in fact, if we make some connection between these Majoranas and the partons, it turns out that the restriction of D goes to one is the same as requiring each fermion have a single occupancy per site. So that's very similar to the Hubbard model. We can't have spin up or spin down. Okay. Um, but uh, all this to say, if uij and this gauge transform uij define the same physical state, what we're going to want is when we project onto the single site occupancy. So before our projection looked like um, this operator, which was projecting onto D equals one, now we project onto single site. Um, so that's the basic construction. Um, we can use symmetries and we can think about how the mean field parameters change with those symmetries uh, to try to define some projective symmetry group. Okay, but I'm a little over time, so I will finish. Um, so I introduced a solvable Kataev model. I showed you that it's a quantum spin liquid, hopefully based on what we discussed last time. Um, I showed an experimental signature, briefly discussed it. 
um, and I segued a little bit into mean field theory and projective symmetry groups. Um, cool. Any questions? Yeah, uh, I, have a, I, I think I should know this, and maybe, maybe I'll think of it if I just reflect a while. But uh, when, when you when you add the constraint that tells you that, that you know fermion number is one, uh, you've that that give, gives you back the right dimension for your for the physical Hilbert space, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. So so then what what what's with this? Uh, if if I if I enforce this constraint that you know fermion number is one, why why do I have to do this stuff about integrating over gauge fields and blah blah blah? If if I've already projected the right size of the Hilbert space. Yeah. So so the key restriction is that the gauge fields have to transform the right way um, with the symmetries of the system. Um, so. Like, I, I, I don't know, maybe that, that doesn't answer your question, but. Um, like, like it, 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 you know, when we do this projection onto a certain fermion number, like, uh, is that is that the, the same? I, I, I am trying to remind, remember what happened in Michael Levin's lectures, but is there supposed to be a relation between the projection onto Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. There's a relation between the projection onto the fermion number fixed sector and gauge invariance vector. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Like like Gauss, Gauss's law is the the operator doing Gauss's law is, is fermion number minus one or something, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And and you can see that. So I've been a little um, hand wavy, but like it's not an accident that in both the Majoranas and the um, and and the setup here will have single site occupancy or D equals one and we're projecting um, into into our physical space. Like that's been chosen. Uh, we could have equally, as as I said earlier, we could have had um, D equals minus one equally well. Um, but in order to like for example get the uh, poly matrices to have the right relations, um, we needed to to pick one of those. Uh, and that's uh, related, I think, to what you're talking about. Um, so, so like like divergence of E, the extent that that is well defined since you have SU2 or whatever, divergence of E is like D minus one as an operator or something. Um, yeah, I don't think I'd be able to prove that to you, but I guess if you think about um, maybe on a single site, the links. Yeah, I, I, I think that should be true, but yeah. Um, so I guess the, the, the basic thing for the, the mean field theory um, for those of you who have not uh, done something like this before, is that on a generic lattice, you'll have some lattice symmetries, like for example, translation. And you want to ensure that your, um, your mean field parameters transform in a reasonable way under those. And so you can make sure that they transform correctly under gauge fields. Um, and this will uh, take care of this projection for you. Yeah, I guess I want to make some comment. Maybe you said this, but if you do a mean field, you actually don't, you actually don't impose the uh, physical condition first. You actually impose some uh, average physical condition and then do the mean field. Otherwise, you can. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you can't can't do anything. Right, and and then when you're done, you you're ex, uh, you're imposing it exactly with this projector. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, like the example might be uh, if we're enforcing single site occupancy. Um, so, let's say we have some band structure, um, and I'll pick an interesting band structure where, where I have uh, some overlap here. Um, actually, let me draw this deeper. 
and we're enforcing single site, what that means is we want to fill up exactly half of all sites. Um, and that's just an average. So in K space, we're going to fill up this band and we're going to have some uh, Fermi surface here. Uh, and we're going to have to fill up this band and have some Fermi surface there. But we're, we're making sure to fill sites equal to one on average. Uh, and then when we do anything more serious, we're enforcing that more precisely. Yeah, yeah, I guess what I mean is that you can have various answers. Say you can have a translation invariant one and uh, and also with uh, various size of unit cell. Then you, then in order to impose the, uh, the constraint of single site occupancy, you will need to introduce um, the as many parameters of uh, chemical potentials as the uh, unit cells size that, mm -hmm. that you made of that, that that's you assume in your answers and then you try to do a mean field calculation hmm. by varying the chemical potential and uh, satisfy the self and uh, satisfy the constraint then you can get some mean field energy and you can compare various mean field answers of different unit cell to pick out uh, lowest energy ones yeah that's usually how people do this mean field Wait, so, yeah. so it's a pattern construction mm -hmm. I, I, normally what you know the the okay the, the chemical potential is like the the time component of whatever dh field you're yes in, right? yeah. so does this mean you have to introduce like a a bunch of different cage fields or something if, if you do a, uh yeah yeah and an another way to think of that is like um for people who have seen the uh, path integral in statistical field theory is you'll introduce a bunch of different Lagrange multipliers um, in your path integral, which are meant to keep uh, one, one per site, uh, which, which is exactly what Ethan is talking about. Those are gauge fields. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess I was try still trying to understand the, the I, I, it's, it's like uh, you, you, you introduce these Lagrange multipliers there, as you were saying, to take care of the constraints. And then to me, that feels like, okay, you're done. You've, you've implemented the constraints exactly, right? Uh, so yeah, I'm trying yeah. to understand where the, where the rest of the gauge field part comes from. Like, uh, wh where, why you actually have like a, the full structure of actual gauge fields and stuff, uh, you know, spatial components of gauge fields, blah, 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 when it seems like just the time component is all you need to implement the Constraint. Oh, okay. Yeah, that that's going to come from the fluctuation of the order parameters themselves. Um, so, so, so that uh, seemed to arise after you've integrated some stuff out or something. Yeah, yeah. So I I know like in Xiaogang's treatment of the uh, chiral spin liquid on the square lattice, uh, you have some pairing term chi ij. Um, and it's coupled to, or rather, sorry, this is a hopping term, not a pairing term. Um, so there's some term like this, and ha, huh, I think I'm limited to the number of things I can draw. Uh, but, but it's a hopping term, um, and can I now draw? Huh. So there's some phase associated with it, and when you allow that phase to fluctuate, then you're going to get additional gauge fields. Yeah, so th this, this, this is what I'm familiar with. Like the nor normal thing that I'm familiar with is you, you take your constraint, you implement it by a Lagrange multiplier, and then you also have some other interactions or stuff that you want to deal with in mean field. And when you deal with them in mean field, these parameters that you add for decoupling the interactions behave like the spatial components of the gauge field, right? Uh, like at chi ajs or something, right? Right, uh, right. You know, the, the gauge field appears you know, time component comes from the Lagrange multiplier doing the constraint, and then the spatial components come from decoupling the interactions, right? But it seems, to, but I guess I don't understand how, why you always get the structure of like a genuine gauge theory every time. Like, uh, it, it kind of seems like the, the time component of the gauge field and then the other 
are coming from very different place sites to get I don't know if I'm, I'm being coached. Yeah, I, I, I think so. The, the way that I actually learned this is from a talk that Federico Becca gave. Um, and in, in his talk, he starts sort of the way I did, which is like you have this physical spin operator and the way the gauge fields are coming about is, is they're just things that leave this invariant. Um, and so they're like directly a result of the fractionalization, which is, I, I think how, how you end up with a structure of a gauge uh, theory every time. Um, because it, it, it's actually coming from the, um, the fractionalization. Oh yeah, I also wanted to ask, uh, when you have, when you're talking about the uh, turn numbers and edge modes and all this stuff, right? Uh, is yeah. there anything do you have to worry about since, since with Majorana's like the, you know, Majorana K is not independent from Majorana minus K, right? Is there any difference between real and complex fermions when you're talking about stuff like this? Um, so, when, when you are doing, like when you're finding out the uh, heat that's conducted along the edge, uh, the, the only difference really is that instead of integrating from line, a negative infinity to infinity, you integrate from zero to infinity. Um, which, I'm, I, so, so I think you could, like the fact that C minus K is just C dagger K, um, uh -huh. It is linked to this one half because you're integrating over yeah, half of the k space. Okay, but but like like the the calculation of like a turn number or something for some band is is not going to care about the yeah yeah that doesn't like, care like about the, the fact that this that my, that my, my ironic cone or whatever when the ironic cone creates you have this yeah that that just cares about the band structure. Um. Like you, you can define a turn number um, just in terms of like some cross product of right, those right. Okay. integrated over the, the block sphere. So it doesn't really de de depend on the Hilbert space that the Hamiltonian acts on, just the, the weight functions. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it does. At least I'm certainly not aware of any case where it would. Cool. Any other questions? Uh, if you do have questions and you think of them later, uh, I think Margarita already, already indicated that she might post them in Slack, but you should follow her example and post in the, the questions channel in Slack. Um, and anyone who sees these questions, please feel free, free to answer them. Um, the idea is just to kind of have some nice discussion about um, confusion, confusing things in that week's talk.